Evening, everybody. Great to see such a great crowd here. My name is Kent Jones. Welcome to tonight's discussion. And please welcome Claire Denis. My bag. No, I have my bag with my face on it. <laughs> oh. Available in the lobby. Thank you, Kent. Thank you. I hope uh, I will be able to say good things. I have no doubt that you'll be able to say mm -hmm. good things. You know, I was thinking that it might be nice to just start um, by talking just a little bit about um, Pierre Rission. Of course. Because we're, we're actually paying tribute to Pierre this year with uh, our yeah. retrospective section, and he's someone who meant a lot to you and to many other people as well. Yeah. For, for, for me, Pierre Rission was... Um, I never thought he was going to be interested in me. You, you see what I mean? So when he, I met him in Venice Film Festival, I guess, and he sort of came to me as a sort of God, you mm. know, like opening his arm. Mm. And I felt, wow, this is now I'm really in film, you know? Mm. Mm. Because Pierre sort of say, you belong. You know, mm -hmm. and then I realized it was only is because he was a shy man mm -hmm. that he he would be behave in such a, a way. He was not at all thinking uh, like that, but he was um, shy, and it made him very solemn. Mm -hmm. His shyness, mm -hmm. and then he. He came to the editing room when we were, we had finished um, editing Image of High Life, and he gave us advice, uh, which we didn't follow because, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it was too late. Uh, the producers, they had another plan in mind, so yeah. it was not possible. But it was so great to feel he was there behind mm. the, the the film, like um, not only giving an advice about the filmmaking, but also giving an advice about what to do next, mm. how to mm. to do it. You know, mm. this yeah. was great, and and uh, um, this was maybe on a Thursday, and then the next Friday. Mm. His assistant told me, or oh, the next Saturday morning, he died. And I, I felt really, mm, I didn't believe, because he, of course I knew, like everybody, he was uh, not in great shape, but his, his, mm. the way he was living in cinema, in filmmaking, made him a sort of, uh, normal immortal, you know, like yeah. someone who could be not so well physically and yet being there always. Mm. Yeah. Because his advice was never uh, restrictive. He was never complaining about you didn't do this, you didn't do that. It was always a positive mm -hmm. thing. Just for those of you in the audience who, who, who have never heard of Pierre, we are doing this little tribute to him uh, in the retrospective section this year with a selection of movies that he that he particularly loved. And he was someone who was not a filmmaker. He made a couple films, but yeah. he, was, he was really someone who was um, a grand spirit of the cinema, who brought mm -hmm. a yeah. lot of films and filmmakers to the West uh, without Pierre, yeah. a touch of Zen. I w we were just looking at the King Who film, the long version of it never would have come to the West. Many, many other filmmakers. Lino Broca. Uh, it was like yeah. uh, so important in South Korea. Yeah. For many South Korean directors. Yeah. Mm. Um, I also, just before we get started in the clips. Uh, there is also, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt no, no, you. No. I swear to myself that I was 
going to say a word about also Oleg, this Russian director who is still detained and yeah. um, mm -hmm. uh, not E.T. I mean, uh, he's on a hunger stri strike. A hunger yeah. strike, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So it, it's um, it seems surprising to say that just like that, um, but but it's uh, it's important to support for him to know that in every festival people are supporting him. Mm -hmm. um, I remember. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, and I don't remember where it was, but um, we were talking and you were say you said something that's always stuck with me, which was, I don't want to make cinema, I want to make a movie. <laughs> and that's, um, yeah. uh, it seemed like a good place to start here. Yeah. Yes, because, uh, I know what I wanted to say by that. I thought I didn't want to be someone belonging to the world of cinema, making cinema. I wanted to be, to feel able and to feel in physically that I was making a movie, that I have made a movie, yeah. which is something um, more important still Today, I, I still believe cinema is so abstract, you know, so vast that to make a movie is seem like banal as opposed to film, but m a movie is, is um, like an egg. Yeah. It, it's had, for me, a movie has a round shape, like the tin that we are containing the film. And it's some s it's um, solid, um, something solid, not cinema. Mm -hmm. mm. I, I don't know. If something I well, actually, myself. something physical, something that comes physical <coughs> and and completely uh, build, you know, something physical and a, a also an object you can watch, you can touch something that exists. Cinema for me is a world of when I dream. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it would be good to start off with um, a clip from a film by Jim Jarmusch and who's someone who's you're, you're very close to as a friend and who you, you uh, worked with um, on Down by Law, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and also, the reason for this film, Mystery Train, was also because it's shot by Robbie Muller, who passed away yeah. recently. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. And Robbie, uh, who died yeah. very, not long ago. Yeah. And I learned so much from him. What did you learn from, from him, do you think? I met him when I was in pre-production for Paris, Texas, the yeah. Van, Wim Wenders movie. Yeah. And Robbie get in LA in advance to choose the film, to do test, camera test, with his assistant. Mm -hmm. They came from Holland. And Robbie was so special, so... Um, Concentrate, mm -hmm. you know. Sometimes, so concentrate, it would be not easy to co have con a, a, a simple contact with him. Mm -hmm. But he was also a very generous person, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. of course, a very talented. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was more than a DP. I would say he was someone who conceived cinema or movie making. I should say, yeah. with a shape already, you know. Mm. Mm -hmm. I remember when we were shooting Paris, Texas, once we were filming uh, um, Harry Dean Stanton, the two brothers, yeah. and, um, and Stockwell in, in a sort of diner somewhere in Texas. In Texas, yeah. And, and that scene, they were face to face, 
from the interior and from the exterior, a window shut. And Robbie was sort of nervous, and I thought it was because of the time and because I was the first AD, I thought maybe he's nervous against me. And he said, no, but uh, not against you, but I really, I don't understand what kind of frame Vim wants. Uh, I don't understand what kind of frame he wants to do. And I said, I, I, I could not feel. It was the difference was maybe only one meter, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And Later, I understood very well what he meant. Yeah. What do you think he meant? He meant that th this little difference of framing yeah. was so important to him that he was su su suspecting Vim not to be the same he, he knew before, you know? Mm -hmm. As if it was, oh, one meter more or less doesn't oh, matter, you know? Yeah. And, and, of course, it was not but I really like that, you know, yeah. this uh, sort of, yeah. But I would imagine that he and Jim Jarmusch were really closely aligned Ah, with spirits. Jim, yeah, with Jim. With Jim, they get along very <laughs> immensely well. I mean, with Vim, too. But they, they were, um, Jim has a different kind of humor, you mm -hmm. know? And uh, the relation between Vim and Robbie was in German. So it was like secret, their yeah. own relation. And with um, in, in, in Louisiana, where we were shooting down by law, um, Robbie was um, extremely funny when he was speaking English, uh, ex trying to express in his own English to Jim uh, what we should do or what we should not do. And also, um, he was very happy to, I think, to go back to black and white. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this film is color. Let's, yeah, take, let's, yeah, yeah. let's go to the clip from, uh, yeah. the first clip from Mystery Train. Uh, <laughs> there is no one like Jim to do those tracking shots mm. in, in showing um, a city, yeah. that even if it's the outskirt of a city like, like New York or Florida or... Or Patterson. Paris or New Pat Orleans. Patterson, the last one. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Memphis here. As nobody else, you know? You get that feeling, and it's never, the car is so, explains so many things about Memphis, mm -hmm. the, the red suitcase always, and it's not the first time there is a tracking shot with a suitcase, with a suitcase. Mm -hmm. And this little melancholic humor in a couple and this young Japanese actor who looks so much like Jim, for me, it's so striking. <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah. He's, he's really like Jim, you yeah. know? And he appears at, at the end of Patterson. Yeah. Um, it's a, yeah. You know, giving the, the notebook to Adam yeah. Driver. Yeah. 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 Mm. And the, the delicate, the quality, the delicacy of the colors yeah. in, in this sort of end of day? Well, going from midday to yeah. mm -hmm. you know, late afternoon yeah. to twilight to end, night. Yeah. Then the, the dusk reveal more and more the color. Yeah. It's so great that Robbie was a, a master of that. Yeah. Mm? And, and the great score by John Lurie. Sure. Yeah. Sure, yeah. I wave him, this John, so great, huh, this, yeah. this. Is that one of your, one of your favorites? I think I like all of them, but um, this mystery train was the film he made after Down By Low, yeah, yeah. and I wanted so much 
to be t going there with him, you know. Mm -hmm. But then uh, at that time I was already me in Cameroon shooting, and I yeah, yeah, and I was desperate not to be uh, sharing that moment in Memphis, mm -hmm. and I remember. Well, I mean, the film is in three parts, huh? mm -hmm. three, and and this I like too a lot, and I think s there is also a remarkable thing with the those in between sequence in the hotel with Screaming Jay Hawkins, yeah, and with Sankri Screaming Lee. Jay Hawkins and and um, the nephew Sankey Lee, right? Yeah, yeah, Sankey Lee, yeah, and and. Then in the third part, Joe Strummer. Yes. And I met him thanks to Jim. Mm -hmm. Just thinking today, I, I did meet Joe Strummer. Is also a dear person who is not there anymore. Yeah. But Jim would always say great things about the people he loved. He said, oh, he died in such a nice way, smoking a cigarette. <laughs> on his sofa <laughs> watching TV. Mm -hmm. You know, it that's really Jim. Like yeah. you know? Yeah. That's that's something the pleasure of life. Yeah. Yeah. Smoking a cigarette. Two years ago Jim did this conversation yeah. and he showed a clip from a movie called Harakiri and he it, it, he um he quit smoking, as I'm sure he told you, and he, he yeah. bought a book called How to Quit Smoking. And you know, he said to Sarah, okay, you have to leave the house for a week, I'm gonna quit smoking now. And, and then he, he just watched Harakiri by over and over again. <laughs> the last seven minutes of it, was yeah, just, yeah. you know, everybody getting their you know, limbs torn off. Um, yeah. That's how he but made it through. But even though qu quitting smoking is something, yep. and then, an actor or a sub, an actress in a film uh, lighting a cigarette, yeah. it's another thing. Yep. Huh? It's yeah. so, uh, in Jim's movie, it's so cinematographic. It's yeah. like it's belong like a car, hmm. like a tracking shot yep. to the history of mo filmmaking, yeah. movie making. Yeah. Mm. And he even made a movie called Coffee and Cigarettes, too. Of course. <laughs> Those famous. I think that the next clip that we're going to do is, is uh, Chantal Ackerman. Yeah. Je tue il And I'm yeah. I I don't want to be desperate and to speak only about dead people, but <laughs> it's because <laughs> Ch uh, Chantal, you know, it's it's so much people asking me what is it to be a female director? What is it? And I dislike this question because. Number one, I don't like female. I, I think yeah. it's not. And when I met Chantal, she was this beautiful young woman making film. No, no, but she was fierce, you yeah. know? She, she was beautiful and fierce, and she was not a female filmmaker. She was such a beautiful young woman mm -hmm making her own film, mm -hmm. you know? It, it some, and je tue, and this film, this extract, I mean, is so, uh, says so much about her strength, yeah. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she was fierce, right? I mean, yeah, she, and she was also eyes. not, she was in a, always in a rage, mm. you know, a rage, to do more, a rage not to get enough money, a rage. There was always this fight inside her, you know? Yeah. Mm. She was, I, I, I heard a story that she was, she gave a talk once and someone asked her a question and it was filled with lots of um, jargon, you know, about semiotics and Roland Barthes or something, you know, and it, it went on for a very long time and after the woman was done asking her the question, Sean Sal said, do you talk to your mother like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so let's go to the clip. Je tue il It's an amazing relationship that she had with Babette Mongold, her, her DP. Yeah. I think you can, yeah. you know. Yeah. Mm. 
also this trust in the frame yeah. and the time. Yeah. It's something sometime I I guess in for a person like Chantal or for Jim there is for Jim Jarmusch, for Chantal Ackerman, it's 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 the material in which a film exists. Mm. It's the time of a shot and the frame. It's contained into the frame. And, and it means for me a, a total trust mm -hmm. in filmmaking. Mm -hmm. There is nothing else. You, there is not trying to hide, um, to hide by um, activity or something else, just the trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's true? I mean, that seems like it could be a statement about your own work as well, about the frame, the, uh, about your work, the trust uh, in the frame. Yeah, of course I trust the frame. Maybe me, I did, I, I do it in a different way because working with Agnès Godard was, was a way we, we find together um, when we started working together, it was always to trust the frame, but to, to trust a certain rhythm inside, mm -hmm. not to, to find a way um, to look at our characters. Yeah. That was what matters a lot for us. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's um. It's interesting that now it's so easy for filmmakers who are shooting digitally, and particularly when they shoot raw, to reframe. Yeah. Afterwards. Mm -mm. Um, I know. Yeah. I know. It's, um, it's much more common than people realize. It happens a lot. Yeah. But, um, it's. I think. I have no judgment of that. Mm. I life we did on digital, but I had no row. Yeah. Because we had a, a small camera, you yeah. know. Yeah. And in a way, it was not important for us. I, I think the, the importance of framing, if you know in the editing room or in the process of post-production, mm -hmm. you can reframe, do this, do that. Uh, it it um, evacuate evacuate the tension and also the pleasure and of of the sh of shooting yeah. because then I remember before I start shooting I life someone told me I had I needed for the film a corridor in the middle and someone told me don't oh, please stop talking about that corridor, okay? <laughs> because I wanted a corridor, and it was very in a studio, and I, I needed that um, the character could be framed in fit at the end of the corridor, not uh, size. Yeah. Mm. And, and I was told, this is, we, we would do it in 3D, the corridor, you know? And, and I thought, I, I was ready to experience that, mm. but then I thought, we, it, it, it's going to be terrible. Nobody will feel anything mm -hmm. while we are shooting mm. if um, the corridor is not there, you know? Yeah. What will it mean to be in a jail if there is not a corridor, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's strange. For me, it has to be not reality, but the reality of the frame. Mm -hmm. Not something you can change afterwards. The physical reality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that the yeah, people exactly. are occupying has so to be. So everyone feels the same thing at the same moment. Yes. If you, if you frame an actor um, so in a sort of medium shot, thinking maybe you can do an extreme close-up at the end in the editing room, it's unfair for the actor or actress in a way, mm -hmm. you know? I say that because maybe I'm a, 
an old-fashioned person, but I think it's yeah. better to share an extreme close-up with the actor or the actress because they they feel the presence of the camera. Well, the actor for the actors and the actresses, it's yeah. really important yeah. to know yeah. what yeah. the distance is. Yeah. They really uh, mm -hmm. that's crucial for them. Um, so the next clip is Imamura, yeah. which is a different kind of um, sure. experience. <laughs> yes, very different. Yeah. Great, too. But, and the film is Intentions of Murder. Yeah. Right? So should we just go into it and then... Yeah. Uh, yeah or do you, you want, want to see... Do you want to the, the, this is a film I, I, I heard to uh, Serge Danet, a, a French critic writing in, who direct Cahiers du Cinéma d'Anois, writing in Libération, a, a newspaper, French newspaper, and then he create a magazine called Trafic. Mm. And he, one summer, the, in summer in Paris, probably in New York too, I am sure, you have um, a new print of old film, mm -hmm. you know, in, in theater, and they, there was a new print an, of a, Imamura movies made in 64, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And Serge wrote in Liberation, Serge Jeanne wrote in Liberation. Mm, it's uh, a good time to watch the, the big pig, <laughs> la grosse cochon. And I thought, oh, this is so rude to speak about a, an actress like that, you know? Mm -hmm. and what is this? And I went to see the film. I never seen the film before. Mm. And I real, realized it meant something so beautiful that she was, it was a, a sort of anti-moral judgment, yeah. as if this woman was exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah. So, wait. so let's look at that clip. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mentioned that film, not because of Serge Danet, but because I was very moved by the way uh, Imamura described this, this um, world, uh, the suburb of Tokyo after the Second World War, and this young woman is uh, married to a middle class uh, guy and they have a, a son. They live in a new settlement of small houses yeah. outside Tokyo near a railway station who is the sort of um, the musical link through the film. Yeah. And she is despised by the neighbor by a mother-in-law, by her husband, and even by the little boy, her son, because she was, um, she's an abandoned girl yeah. who was raised in a convent, and she was, she was given to marriage, you know? She was, it was not even a choice. So she's a sort of maid, she's treated like a maid, uh, to cook meal, to clean the house, even though she's a mother, and sometimes she's also treated um, when the husband wants to make love, he, he, he uses her, you know. Um, yeah, he uses her, I, I cannot say anything else. But in the very beginning of the film, you see this young, young guy, is a student in the story, who is watching this couple in a, train station, because the train is the link from center of Tokyo to the suburb, as if all the story was linked by the train. And really, that narr narrative is great. And it's scope. And this young man is at the edge of the frame. You could easily ignore him, but he's there, you know? and. And suddenly he will 
erupt, in, intrude in her house, pretending to steal money because he's, he's sick in his mother for this medication. He has a problem, sort of bronchitis, so I don't remember. But it, she's there, and he's, there is this rape scene. And it's horrible in a way, and yet they actually really fell in love because they are together. Um, how would you say, not consider in the society? They are like left, left. Yeah. Um, you know. You're like outcast. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Outcast, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. The way they fell in love is is um, a very touching, very moving, and it it's a tragedy, and yes, and yet it's it's full of tenderness mm. and and respect for those people. Yeah, yeah, and by the way, because we were. Speaking about framing this film in scope, mm. it, the, the framing, the way, um, the, the narration I is growing with the framing. I mean, the, the camera work brought so much to the way the story is told. Yeah. And that was when you were shooting in scope, you had a very, very limited choice of lenses. And yeah. so the way that her face yeah. distorts just a little bit yeah. when she's yeah, pressed exactly. up close, yeah. Is, yeah. Is, is he was a real master with mm. that. Um, he is a master. And he, in a way, when you see all those special effects today, the, this film is full of special effects made, made. In the camera. In the <laughs> camera, you know? Yeah. Um, There's a great use of long lenses too, I think. With yeah, with, yeah with it's, the um, it's so exciting yeah. to see that, you know. It's so, you learn, it, it, watching a film like that makes you immediately want to see more films, mm -hmm. to make films, to, to be ba part of this adventure, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, the next clip that we're going to show is from Jane Campion's An Angel at My Table. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Thank you. I don't, I don't Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I'm aware that it's great to see all those it's moments nice to watch, of cinema. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's, and, and very different, because there's an artist, you know, Imamura is an artist who's about discomfort, physical yeah. discomfort. It's where he really Physical discomfort, <coughs> but when the film is finished, you realize also, the the the, the way he, he respect those people. Yeah. That, that's really great. <coughs> so just why don't we just go to the Jane yeah, Campion the, to, film to as a nice complete yeah. contrast, <laughs> uh, an angel at yeah. my table. Um, I could be in tears easily when I see those images. Mm -hmm. The story. The way Jane Campion told the story of this little girl becoming a, a famous writer yeah. through experiencing such a terrible childhood yeah. and in New Zealand and the youth. Um, and the little dance. It's the, it's the contrast exactly. It's what Jane Campion knows so well to show that sometimes you can escape a certain harshness of life. Mm -hmm. um, the end of that movie, it's when this little girl is becoming a famous writer already. And she's, uh, she lives in a caravan next to her house, and that's the last scene. It's, and 
it's a very happy ending. And, but it's not that suddenly there is a music and a starry, a starry night and she, as a woman, opened the door of the caravan, uh, make two step in the garden and start twisting a little bit on the music. And that's the end of the film. Yeah. And I was, it's like this little dance, you know, it's like as if there is a possible harmony yeah. always, mm -hmm. even if it's really hard to get there. Mm -hmm. This ending kills me when I think about it, you know, okay. yeah. Yeah. Is she a filmmaker who's whose work you feel a real kinship with as she's, with the work that she's done since? Mm, I admire her work uh, before and, but since that film I realized I, I, mm, I met, this film was in Venice and I was in Venice Film Festival too with a film, and since that film, I, I wanted to, to tell her, mm. uh, not I love you, but to tell her I, I feel you. Mm -hmm. I, I, I understand everything you do in a film, mm. you know? Mm. Um, and when we were shooting High Life, she received a prize in, in Köln. Mm. And I was asked to give her the prize. Mm -hmm. And it was a great moment because yeah. she's a, like Chantal, she, she, she's not a female director. She's, she's a director. She's yeah. directing films the way she feels, mm. you know, as a woman. That's mm. much more important, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think this film also, also it, it's a bio of a, f of a writer. Mm -hmm. It's, I think, very much, it says a lot about what it is to become a film director. Yeah. It's to go through a lot of, uh, not, it's to cross a lot of barrier, mm -hmm. you know? drawbacks, and yet to keep in mind that the important is the harmony of, of, of what you want to do, yeah. yeah, achieve, yeah, I think. And to hold on to that, yeah. that spark, yeah. no matter, w with all the I remember in that, that film, later in the second part, when the, She's an adult studying in, in England. The, the, the character is going in Spain for a week, I guess, mm. in Mallorca. I don't remember so well. But I think there is a shot of that young actress, English young actress, and she's swimming in the, in the sea. And it's a shot from above. And I... It's not a very long scene, just that shot from above and she's swimming. And at that moment of the film, that scene expressed so much, here I am. Mm -hmm. Here I'm going, this is, now I am able, it, it's not a metaphor of I can swim in my life, no. It's here I am, in, I am physically in my life. Mm -hmm. I, I felt a shot like that means a lot about making film. Yeah. Mm. Um, the last two clips are two different, two films and two clips, they're related films. Um, the first is Tuki Boki by Gibril Diop Mambetti, and the second is, Amat, is Mati Diop's film, uh, uh, Mil Salai, A Thousand Sons. And can you explain the relationship between the two films? Yeah, it's something not very, 
if you, uh, Tukibuki was made in 74 in Senegal mm. uh, by Jibril Mambeti Diop, who was I'm a not sure young. I understand. Um, <laughs> There's a young. Uh, <laughs> this is. No, it's my my phone suddenly started speaking. <laughs> no, no, no. It's incredible. It, it's a young. Uh, it was his first film, mm. and he made this film. Already to make to make this film in Senegal in '74 was not so easy, but he made the story of this young couple, and for it's a beautiful film about two young kids. It's very close to. Jim Jarmusch movies. Yeah. Huh? And it's uh, two young kids in love. Um, Who want to go to Paris, the dream of going to Paris. Yeah, and yeah. So, but only the boy is going to Paris because the girl cannot go and only the boy will go and they say goodbye as he's going on that boat. Mm. Uh, we will go to Marseille probably and then France and France and then Paris. And the way he shot those two kids from poor family, um, harsh life too, you know. And, and then 30 years after, a young woman who is a director, uh, his niece. Yeah, Mati Diop. Mati Diop, she also act in one of my film in 35 Shots of Rome. She, she went to Senegal, made a film about her uncle. And at the end of her film, and also you see this tall, great, um, white hair man get to a, a, um, open air cinema. Yep. And is the young actor of uh, Tukibuki yeah. coming back to watch him himself on the mm. screen. And he's a farmer. He makes a living yeah, as a farmer. Yeah, he's a farmer yeah. with his uh, cows. Huh? Yeah. Like a Western. It starts like a Western. Yes. So great. Yeah. You know? uh, this connection is so... It, it's not family thing. It's really how cinema works. Mm. You see a film and then you respond to that film, yes. you know? That's what I think about making film. And he to tells a story about the fact that the woman, his first love, left and went it away. And so oh yeah, I'm sorry yeah. not to, yeah, I'm sorry. No. Well, let's, let's, yeah, let's yeah. look at the clips. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very amazing huh, to see This young, this young couple, and then this man. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Mati is finishing the film now, and I. I think she. She is doing well. Mm. She's going to be, a, I hope, a, a, a director, a, a film director. Who makes movies. <laughs> And Tuki Buki is one of the, you know, I mean, that's it's such a landmark. Incredible mm, film, yeah. you know. Yeah. They, they, they both survive mm. by stealing. She even uh, do some prostitution to get some money. And, and they do those young, I mean, they are so beautiful. And, and when you read newspaper today and you hear about the immigration in Europe, mm -hmm. And you see, this is 70s, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's great, this selection of the, the moment with the Josephine Baker yes. song, Paris, Paris, Paris. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. trees. Beautiful voice of Josephine Baker. Well, you picked some great movies. Um, there are a lot more that we could talk about. There was so many more, you yeah, know? I mean, yeah. it's imp also, I was in in a, a moment where I was not, f I was finishing the other movie, so I was not so concentrated, but you, you helped me a lot. Mm. Um, no, those, those clips are 
among so many other, there could have been endless um, moment with, it's those moments where you, you realize that a film can leave inside you a, a, tra a trace, a mark forever that um, is um, not, that is alive, that is not only a souvenir, it's alive, it's like a, a sort of a movement. It's like a little, it's a, um, the trace creates a, a movement inside. So makes you, makes me and, and the people who, who can feel that, and I'm sure there are many, um, able to crave for other films not to be satisfied by ordinary image or any film, but really searching something in, in cinema, in film, in movies, to go back to that word that um, not only moves them, but will stay as an alive memory, uh, something you can always be with. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember talking to you so many times about William Faulkner, yeah. the writer. Yeah. And I, before I came here today, I thought, um, probably can think I'm crazy with <laughs> my William Faulkner uh, obsession. But it's because there is in William Faulkner something that is very close to cinema, something that is also leaves you um, scars that are not painful, the, the, the traces that are always um, like viruses. Yeah, uh, it, it's still alive in in your mind in mm. your physical reaction. Especially late in August, that's the one. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a way of writing mm. that I, I'm sure I've been inspiring filmmaking, whether or not people are aware of it, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Claire. Thank you very much. And Thank you. <laughs>